It's an exciting night. My name is Jane Schodel. I'm one of the festival programmers, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's world premiere screening of Hold the Dark, directed by Jeremy Saulnier. <laughs> To begin, we are pleased to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community. We are. We are pleased to present this film at the Visa Screening Room at the Princess of Wales Theatre, and we thank Visa Canada for making that possible. This film is eligible for the Gross People's Choice Award. You can vote for your favorite film at tiff.net slash vote. And we would like to thank Netflix for providing us with this film. Thank you very much. We are thrilled to be presenting the premiere of the newest work from Jeremy Saulnier, whose past films include Blue Ruin, which won the Fipresci Prize at the Director's Fortnight in Cannes, which was followed by Green Room, which played... <laughs> which played in TIFF's Midnight Madness section in 2015. Based on the novel of the same name by William Giraldi, Hold the Dark is a story painted on a much broader canvas than Saulnier's previous films, yet retains many of the narrative characteristics we associate with his work. Chills and thrills, characters with mysterious motives, and a complex and atmospheric story that engages the viewer from the very first frame. The accomplished cast includes Jeffrey Wright, Alexander Skarsgård, Riley Keough, and Canada's own Tantu Cardinal. We are pleased to have the opportunity to speak with some of our guests after the screening, but please join me in welcoming back to Toronto, Jeremy Saulnier. Thank you very much for the introduction. Extremely nervous. Uh, thanks to the festival for having us. Um, I've never unveiled a film for the first time in front of such a large audience. Uh, so it's just my great pleasure, and I, I, I'm so grateful that you're hosting the world premiere of Hold the Dark. Um, I'm going to present it tonight along with a lot of the cast and crew, um, including Jeffrey Wright, Alexander Skarsgård, Riley Keough, James Badgedale, Julian Black Antelope, Tantu Cardinal, and my longtime friend and cohort, Macon Blair, who adapted the screenplay. Um, I want to thank the producing team, Anish, Neil, Russell, Ava and John. I want to thank my team, uh, Maha, Craig, Keith, and Andre, for their, uh, not only do they handle my business affairs, they provide therapy services for me throughout this as I navigate the industry. Um, I want to thank uh, Ted Sarando, Scott Stuber, Matt Levin, and the entire Netflix team for the incredible work that they're doing on behalf of the film and the filmmakers. Uh, they were the best partner for this film, and I'm very grateful. Um, and this is a homecoming for us. Uh, it is indeed a Canadian film. We shot in Alberta, and um, we were very proud of and in debt to the crew that we had there uh, in Calgary and uh, in Alberta. Um, I want to thank my wife, Skye. She's just pretty much the best thing in the universe. And we are partners in this, through and through. Um, and in keeping with uh, this festival's tradition, which I really admire, um, I want to thank the many Aboriginal First Nations of Alberta, uh, specifically the Stony Nakoda and the Tsutina First Nations, who welcomed us onto their land to tell this story. Um, and in, in similar fashion, the filmmakers want to thank the original author of this work, William Giraldi, whose novel inspired us all to come together and tell his story. So 
I won't say much about the film. Please enjoy it. Uh, afterwards, take a few deep breaths. And uh, join me and the cast afterwards for discussion. Thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce screenwriter Macon Blair. And Chion, Julian Black Antelope. Detective Mariam next. James Badge Dale. Medora Sloan. Riley Kyo. And her hubby Vernon. Alexander Skarsgård. And Russell Kaur, played by Jeffrey Wright. Um, there's a lot of things that I've been thinking about this beautiful film since I've seen it, and I wondered if I could take the opportunity to ask some of you, perhaps beginning with Mr. Wright. These are really complex, multifaceted characters. Can you speak a bit about how you approach this role and perhaps your process working with Jeremy? Yeah, it was a pretty straightforward uh, approach. It was really just trying to be uh, beholden to making script and to the book. Uh, I found it to be, when I read it, just one of the most descriptive uh, and lyrical and, uh, and uh, evocative scripts that I'd, 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 I'd uh, been given. And the architecture of the storytelling was really, was really well considered. So literally sitting inside scenes, I would look around and I'd go, wow, man, this is really good. And because I could feel the story moment to moment just in the structure of, of, the, of the scenes, and it just kind of provided a momentum through. So I just, you know, read the, read the words and uh, keep it simple. And then Jeremy creates an environment that's very clear as well. As you can see, his frames aren't random. And so there's a lot of information that you derive from that as well. Um, and um, he also has this, this wonderful, infectious love for the process and love for film, and so, um, you know, I just threw myself into it and tried to uh, be infected by his spirit and, uh, and, uh, and go for it. And you did, thank you. <laughs> um, Mr. Skarsgård, your character has a lot of momentum, can you, as he speaks here, can you speak a bit about your approach to it? This is a really interesting character. <laughs> Yeah, I was dying to find a light comedy or something to do. So, and, then, and then this came along, and it was perfect timing. Um, I, um, I, I try to uh, avoid an arc. I try to avoid, uh, not nuance, but I didn't want, uh, the approach was slightly different to how I, would, how I normally work, where um, it was important that it wasn't, his actions aren't a... Um, it's not PTSD, it's not something that happened in, in the war that caused this, or um, I, I saw it almost as, um, uh, he's like an arrow that cut, no pun intended, but cuts through the story, and he exists in a vacuum in a way, and um, it was quite uh, intimidating and scary in the beginning because um, it was so different the way I, again, I try to avoid that kind of the traditional arc that I'm after, and. And um, so, it, yeah, it was uh, scary, but we had a lot of fun, Jeremy and I, in, in kind of finding that and uh, discovering who, who Vernon Sloan was. And your character, Riley, we begin and end with her. Um, she symbolizes so much. Can you talk a little bit again about your approach to the character? Hmm. Um, well, luckily, between the book and Macon and Jeremy, um, there was sort of a really strong idea about who she was. Um, I think the difficult part would have been trying to find empathy for her, maybe. Um, <laughs> it was, <laughs> that was challenging. Um, 
you know, playing a mother is difficult, um, and playing a mother going through loss is difficult, and then on top of that, trying to figure out what type of person would kill their child is difficult. So um, it was more about figuring out who she was in, you know, inside, and Jeremy and I talked about that a lot, and, you know, because at the end of the day, you have to love them, which can be difficult sometimes, but, um, yeah, I think it was mostly Jeremy and Macon and I coming up with... I felt empathy for her. <laughs> so did I. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you then, sir, could you speak a little bit about your approach? Maybe you've got your mic, thanks. Um, I mean, my approach is just keeping up with Jeffrey. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I, I just to keep it short, I mean, I mean Jeremy, Jeremy and I, we, we, we talked about this idea of just, just holding the light with Miriam, you know, because the circumstances will take us into the darkness and let's just keep it um, kind of a counterbalance, you know, and, uh, you know, just stay present, be a normal human being, listen. <laughs> yes. It. And to you, sir, you play such a pivotal, powerful role in this story. Can you talk about how you perceived your character and approached it? Uh, well, th thanks. Uh, to approach it, um, well, geez, Macon, thanks to the writing, there was no acting required. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, my, uh, my approach to it was, um, I had to take a step back from it. I mean, especially after reading the script, I read the book and then I, uh, I got the script and I read through it and there was uh, a lot of things that kind of hit home, I guess, with like the political views, like in Native and non-Native communities. Uh, so those were very present for me. And, um, but I, I, I didn't want to, I was afraid of making the mistake of making Cheon not what he was up there, but like what some, there, there could have been a lot of wrong avenues to go down. So I wanted to give him some vulnerability and to um, have that connection with Sloan so it's, you know, it's about what's not being said, and it's about the spaces in between. And uh, basically for me, I'm, uh, I'm just happy to be sharing space with these folks over here <laughs> and these folks. And I just, uh, I'm an actor who just runs on instinct, really. Bless your instincts. <laughs> uh, yes, amen. Um, Mr. Blair, I'd like to speak to you in your capacity as a screenwriter. Can you speak a little bit about the challenges of adapting a novel? Is this the first time you've adapted a novel? Uh, no, I've, I've adapted uh, another novel in the past okay. and some short stories, but this one, um, the challenge was just not messing up William's beautiful book. I mean, it, it, it was fully formed and just um, really enchanted me and also Jeremy when he read it, so it was just about not wanting to mess up what was so perfect about it in the first place. Um, the, the novel is, we were faithful mostly to the events of the novel, but so much of it was internalized, like a lot of it's taking place inside Cora's head or inside Vernon's head. So it was just figuring out how to sort of externalize those things. But largely we just, when in doubt, would, you know, look to the book for guidance and... Well, you still did a tremendous job. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up for... Uh, there's a question there. Yes, sir. Bacon Blair. Um, you've written other films, or written other scripts for Jeremy Saulnier, and you've written a script that you directed yourself. When you write, are you thinking about who's going to direct it, and how does, what sort of calculus is happening to decide whether it's for yourself or for Jeremy? I'll repeat the question if I could. Um, the question is for Mr. Blair. When you write, because you've written for that other people have directed, you've directed yourself. When you are going through your process, do you think about that? Who's going to direct, to direct it? Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I think if I, if I didn't know who was going to direct it, then I would probably leave things a lot more open to interpretation so that there's, I, I, I'm not sort of... Um, uh, giving too much to, uh, like stepping on somebody's toes and, you know, giving them room to, to take it where they want it. But since I knew that this one was for Jeremy, I, I specifically tried to, um, we've known each other for very long, so it was about thinking about what um, he loves about movies and what, like, I, I could tell which scenes were going to get cut anyways because I know what he likes and doesn't like, so I was definitely trying to write um, uh, to please him. 
because um, that was the thing is when I read the book, I was like, oh shit, Jeremy can make a, a dynamite movie out of this. And so it was all about like trying to tailor it uh, specifically for his uh, many strengths. Oh, thanks. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> The question is, was it necessary to kill so many policemen? I'm going to assume this was... Let's blame Giraldi for that. Yes. It, it, I mean, it, um, yes. Uh, it, not and, and sorry, what I mean is that it's not necessary to specifically kill policemen. It was necessary for that scene to be uh, extended and horrific. And I, I think it's about a lot of things, but to me it was about people that are in desperate situations, and then you have access to um, really devastating um, weaponry, and, and it was not meant to be like a fun, like cowboys and Indians, it was meant to be like um, a, a, a horror scene, and so protracting that and making it as horrific and as far as how the people are affected, what's going on, the loss of life, that did seem important. We tried not to be cavalier about it, um, but th that was the thinking that went into that sequence. I'd like to ask you, Jeremy, about both the cinematography, the use of shadow and light in this film is remarkable, but also the soundscape, which is very, very emotionally evocative. Can you talk about working with you, the oh, yeah. designers of that, please? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really all one thing. I mean, uh, from performance, if, if anyone on this cast did, did not bring it, they would negate all the the craft that goes into every shot. Um, we have the production designer, Warren Smith, here tonight. Uh, and the world that he built for us was just impeccable. It was a, a, a perfect translation of, of the atmosphere um, that was, that, that Giraldi created in the book and then Macon translated, of course. Um, and the cinematography, uh, you know, Magnus, our DP, uh, he, he was sort of amazing. And also his spirit, that, that sort of, the vitality of just being around someone who really loves to make motion pictures with a positive attitude um, and just a really elegant aesthetic. And he was uh, suggested to me, actually through Ryan and Anish and Neil, the producers, they had done a film called Lean on Pete, I played here last year. And I, I'm a former cinematographer, so it's in my blood. And, I, and assessing his work, he was an easy choice. Uh, and it's really the quality of his lighting. Uh, I, I'm definitely uh, a collaborator when it comes to how do we place the camera, how do we move the camera. And as Jeffrey said, it was, it was very much designed. So, some of it was the most designed work I've ever done in my career, uh, in the shootout especially, just because of the logistics, the pyrotechnics. There wasn't a single green screen on this set the entire film. Um, and, and that's a testament to the, the crew. And, uh, and the cast, and uh, all pulling it off um, practically in camera. It's remarkable. Thank you. If anyone posts a photo of behind the scenes with like a little green screen, <laughs> it's, a, it's probably one for a second unit, but that's about it. <laughs> Liar. Uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just wondering, I know in all of you, uh, Jeremy and Mike, in all of your collaborations, you've never shied away. Obviously, you already touched on this a bit of showing violence and all of its consequences. And I was just wondering, sort of, how you, when you're making your decisions, how to shoot it and stuff like that, sort of how you go about that process. I think it's really admirable. Uh, the gentleman is saying that all of your uh, collaborations, you don't shy away from violence, and he's wondering how you work towards that. What, what's your process and how you put that on the screen? Yeah, I mean, I, I've said it before, I do have to address this often, but I gravitate towards kinetic, high stakes filmmaking. I like peril because my home life is so fucking full of love and joy. <laughs> uh, when I sit down and watch a movie, like I want to be transported. That was a key to this movie. It was not just violence, it was, it was being taken on an odyssey. Um, my films are often very contained by design, so if the powers that be say no, then we get our credit cards, do our Kickstarter, and do it ourselves. And this was just a huge movie uh, by my standards. Um, so what was I talking about again? Um, how you work together no. when Violence, you shoot. violence, yes, yes. Um, I was trying to avoid that. No, it, it, um, it has to have high impact. It has to have a, a certain cinematic and narrative value. And the goal is to have you ask why. Why did so many people have to die? Because it hurt. Not, fuck yeah. Um, 
some movies uh, which I enjoy do that, but it's, I'm in that space now where I do have reverence for loss of life and it has to be grounded and, and it's all about the human performances and the stakes and it should hurt. We have time for one more question. Yes, right there. I love that question. There's a mystical element to the film. Was that something that was from the novel? Is it something you created or working with the indigenous people where you shot the film? Yeah, I mean, you can start because the novel to you was the, the first For translation. Sure. Yeah, it was, it, it was very much a part of the novel and that was a thing that, um, that was one thing that I thought would be interesting for Jeremy to tackle because um, his, his uh, earlier films were much, uh, were, were very grounded and there was no mysticism, anything like that. So that felt new. Um, and the other thing was, I, I just liked how in the book there was a couple of characters, um, the lady in the village, the old hunter, and then there was a third character that actually got, um, ended up not being in the movie, but they kind of represented this idea that maybe what's going on between these characters is a curse or something mystical like that. And so if that's what, you know, if, if that's what you wanted to believe about it, then that would be correct. But there, there's also the version where it's just like, no, these are, these are people without a lot of resources and they're very isolated and alone and it led to a horrible circumstance. Like there's the clinical scientific explanation for this and then there's the, the mystical one. So wanting to sort of have both of those in the movie um, always felt very important. And some of that sort of veered towards the... Su some of that veered towards the supernatural? What? What's happening? No. Um, <laughs> And, I, and, and making right, I, I do like hyper-terrestrial movies. I like super grounded, realistic. But it was a fun challenge to kind of incorporate this mysticism. And even the supernatural, if other people in the film believed it. As a filmmaker, I didn't go there. But I allowed it to be real within the construct of the, of the story and, and the belief systems that were there. Brainiac over here. I'm this. afraid that we've run out of time. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for bringing this film Thank here you. to Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's a wonderful film. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.